everybody and welcome to the Kinesiology Distinguished Lecture. It's part of our department's Exercise is Medicine on Campus Month of Activities. And we will be introducing our speaker in just a minute. But first, I want to let all of you know that we are partnering with the Kansas State University Foundation. They are doing a fundraiser this month specifically to raise funds for students to apply for to then use to pay for exercise certifications. And so um, this fundraiser thus far has raised $320. Most certifications range in cost from $50 to $1,000. And while you guys can apply for scholarships, while you can apply for funds to do research or for travel to present research at conferences, we haven't previously had funds available for certifications. So um, please feel free to share this. It's on our Twitter account for the department as well as our Facebook account. We posted on both today. And the link is ksufoundation.org slash give slash E-I-M-O-C, which is Exercises Medicine on Campus. And so I know they're gonna do a call center, um, is gonna be calling people this week, as well as they're gonna send out another email to push for more donations. But please feel free to share information or contribute if that's something you would like to do. Thank you. Oh, and I'm the interim department head of kinesiology, Katie Heinrich, I forgot to say that part. So I'm really glad that you are all here today. Good afternoon and welcome again to the Kinesiology Distinguished Lecture Series that is presented in partnership with Kansas State Kinesiology Student Association. My name is Carl Lottie and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Kinesiology and I have the honor today to welcome Dr. Benjamin Miller who is part of the Aging and Metabolism Research Program at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation in Oklahoma City. Dr. Miller received his bachelor's and master's degree in kinesiology from the University of Wisconsin and earned his PhD in integrative biology from the University of California, Berkeley. He then moved overseas to complete a postdoctoral fellowship in the Institute of Sports Medicine at the University of Copenhagen and now runs an outstanding and very productive research group at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation. Today is an outstanding publishing and funding uh, record with an emphasis on the biosynthesis and turnover of components of proteostasis, mitochondrial energetics, and the role of nerve 2 signaling and stress resistance under the umbrella of aging. Today, Dr. Miller will present the lecture titled, Viewing a Movie from a Snapshot, Can Capturing Metabolic Flux and Health and Disease, which will address a little bit of the challenge of, of interpreting dynamic physiology using a single time point measurement, and how he creatively uses things like stable isotope tracers to what he says, see the movie. Uh, we'll follow the lecture today uh, with time for questions from the audience and any students or, or audience members who need to leave because of evening classes, we just ask you to do so quietly. Without further ado, let us all welcome again Dr. Miller. So thank you very much. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Is that too loud? Um, so this has been almost a, over a year in the making. <laughs> um, because we kept getting pushed back for some reason. But um, I'll admit to all of you that I am scared to death to teach to a, or talk to a room of undergrads. You're way more intimidating than a group of scientists, okay? <laughs> but I think we'll get through this okay. And what I really wanna emphasize today is not really telling you exactly what my research is. I mean, you're gonna get a glimpse into my research. But it, um, what I wanna really get across is a thought process and how we do things, how I think I do things a little bit differently. So I like to start with this story. Um, this is from World War II. Uh, the planes were going out to do their thing over in Europe. Um, many of them were not making it back. So they brought these planes in and they started analyzing where do we need to reinforce the armor on these planes. So the, this is the, these are the areas where the planes were getting clearly shot and you can't just throw armor over the whole plane because then it becomes much heavier, uses heavier, um, more fuel, doesn't get as far, et cetera. So they were trying to figure out where can they strategically uh, reinforce these planes. And then finally, someone, a famous scientist, um, who was actually in exile from um, Hungary to the United States, pointed out that these were the planes that were making it back. What we wanna know is where the planes that didn't make it back 
were being shopped. Okay, so this is actually an example of um, sort of a selection bias, but I usually think about this as how can we approach the problem differently and think a little bit differently than everybody else does to solve problems. So today I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of what stable isotopes are. They matter a lot to me, probably don't matter as much to you, but I'm going to explain them to you a little bit. And then I'm going to give you four little vignettes of, um, of research that I've done. So if you find one not very interesting, just hang in there and maybe the next one will be interesting to you. So this idea of snapshots is really important to me because um, I'm a physiologist. And so if we go into this really beautiful building in New York City and take a picture, and say we come back six months later and take another picture from that same vantage, we will see that things don't really change that much over that six month period. And in physiology, we're limited to snapshots a lot, whether it's taking a sample from a dish if you're doing an in vitro experiment, um, using a mouse in your study, um, you can usually really only take tissues once from a mouse, or say we do a lot of muscle biopsies in the lab I'm in, so we, we, we're limited in the number of those um, snapshots we can take. But the reality of the situation is physiology is like this. And we miss all of that with our snapshots. So how can we capture all of that movement that occurred during, between those two periods of time? And that's why I like using stable isotopes for my research, is to understand the movement. So I study aging primarily. Um, I'm actually not going to give you a whole lot of aging today, but it's, it's what I'm most interested in. And if we think about the aging process and we think about taking snapshots at young age or older age, and we're literally limited to those two snapshots, how do we infer all those things that happen in between? And how do we capture that? So we, we get these really nice like gene arrays on people to tell us what gene expression is doing in a in an older person versus a younger person. And I almost find that data useless, okay? Because these things change so much even over the course of 24 hours. So how can we infer something that happens over 60 years, 50 years from that, that little snapshot? So, chemistry, yay. Um, so when you look at the periodic table, and you see carbon and it weighs 12.01, why doesn't it weigh 12? Okay, because there's a certain amount of isotopes in the world, and this is the average weight of all the carbons in the world. They don't all weigh 12. Some of them are heavier. Same with hydrogen and same with some of your other elements. So stable isotopes, most of you are familiar with radioactive um, isotopes like carbon-14, but stable isotopes are just one atomic mass unit heavier because they have an extra neutron, but they act chemically identical to um, a non-isotope, and they're safe, they're non-radioactive. So we can use them um, without the concern of that radioactivity. And what we do with stable isotopes is we put them into molecules and we use those as tracers, because if I say, if I put it on this molecule here, which is alanine, amino acid, and I make these carbons heavy, I can distinguish those from the other alanines in the body. So I know that's an alanine I put in because it's a little bit heavier. So how can I use that? So say you walk into your closet, see a trail of ants, and you freak out, you close the door. There must be a million ants in there. How do you really know like, what rate these ants are going across the room if you're just getting this glimpse of it? So this is how we will use stable isotopes. So if I put one ant in that's red every second, so I know I'm putting that one in because it's red. It doesn't show up as well on the screen, but trust me, it's red. And I come back and I take a snapshot, knowing I put one ant in every second, and I take that picture again. I know I'm putting them in at one ant per second. I take this picture, five of them are red, 23 are black. This is how we use stable isotopes. So this is my infusion of an isotope. This is what we call enrichment. And if I do that math, I know that 4.6 ants per second are walking across. Okay, very simple in concept. We can use this, and we, we call this a flux rate. It's the measurement of movement. Another way I could use this, say you have someone replacing bricks in a wall out in your yard, and you suspect they're not working very quickly. 
come out and take a picture, it's hard to tell what rate they're replacing the bricks because they all look the same. So if I go in there and I replace some of them, make some of them red, I know 30% um, of them are red there, I come back two hours later, take the picture, now I know that this many are red. I can do the math and it tells me that 28% of them are being replaced per hour. So it's being able to know what you put in versus that is acting identical to something else you're interested in and it's just a calculation of dilution, okay? So that's how we use tracers. That's all the chemistry math I'm gonna give you, okay? Um, and this is how we measure a synthetic re reaction, how you make something, build something. So first story for you. I'm really interested in muscle and how to maintain muscle mass as we age. If we look at the cross section of a muscle of a 21 year old versus a 63 year old, you don't have to be that advanced in your science to be able to tell the difference between the two. Okay, we lose muscle mass as we age. And we all do it, and there's no way to prevent it. So we study how to slow that process. So maintaining muscle mass is really important because it's your largest metabolic organ by mass in your body, so it uses a lot of energy. So if you start to lose muscle mass, you lose that ability to burn energy um, as much as you did before. Um, so it's important, and it releases endocrine factors, it signals to other tissues, um, if you don't have much muscle mass, it increases your mortality, increases your disability, um, increases your risk of fall. Okay, so these things are all really important to maintaining independence with um, age. So the way I like to think about um, studying muscles, I study proteins. And if we think about the aging process, we need to keep our proteins young. If you think about a nice house um, when you first buy it, it's all nice and pretty, and over time it sort of deteriorates. So your house doesn't have to deteriorate like this. If you maintain it well, you can keep it in sort of this condition. And this is what we need to do with proteins in the body too. So proteins, um, you can't repair them. Okay, we have, no, we have no enzymatic process to repair proteins. Instead, what you do is you break them down and you make a new one. So it's sort of out with the old, in with the new, to maintain sort of this sort of condition. So with our tracers, what I do then is measure the rates at which we're making and breaking down proteins to try to keep them young-like. Sorry if this is too loud. Um, so we call this proteostasis. So it's like the word homeostasis that everybody knows, but it's proteostasis, maintaining the proteins. So our proteins are constantly exposed to things that might damage them. You might hear of reactive oxygen species and things like that. So if we can break them down at a nice rate and replace them, then we can keep a young-like structure. That's the basic gist of what I study. So if you predict that if aging causes deterioration of proteins, what do you think the rate of protein turnover does with age? Do you think it, goes, it increases or decreases? It's probably, your, your thought process would be, it would be a decrease that leads to this aging process. And that's what the field has thought for a while. Oops. So this, when I read papers and I'm interested in muscle, aging decreases muscle protein synthesis is such a throwaway statement that it's not even cited in articles. And I decided to see, well, who, where did that data come from? Because I couldn't find it at first. Where did this idea, besides just sounding nice, where are the data that support that aging actually decreases the turnover of muscle proteins? So I went and I think I found the two papers that all these data came from. Um, very good lab at the Mayo Clinic. They showed that already by middle age, this is the rate at which you're making proteins from young to middle age is already decreased and is the same at old, and these are just mitochondrial proteins, which I'm also interested in, also decreased by middle age. Well, when I looked at the study, um, for the first, for first thing, is this was based on an N of eight, and this was based on an N of six to seven. So this, say, this, this sentence that is so ingrained in the literature that I think came from these two studies is based on a really, really small sample size, okay? So we do our studies a little bit differently. So this is how you do an isotope study, like the, from the data I just showed you. A person lays in bed, they get an infusion of an isotope, 
of amino acid isotope. They usually sit in bed for about four to six hours, and then we come and take a muscle biopsy because we look at how much that isotope got into the muscle proteins, okay? And that's how those studies were done. And this is how I used to do studies, too. This is how I was taught to do studies. We have started using a different isotope in my lab, and this is a heavy hydrogen in water. So this acts just like water, which makes it um, really easy to use. So I put it in drinking water for animal studies. I gave it to humans in a glass. I'll put it in media for an in vitro study. And this heavy hydrogen, which is called deuterium, gets incorporated into alanine or any amino acid, ribose and deoxyribose. So then when these get filled up with heavy hydrogens, and so this alanine gets made into a protein, I can study the synthetic rate of the protein from this water going to alanine to protein. And I actually use this also a lot for um, ribose to measure the making of RNA and deoxyribose to look at the making of DNA. So you make DNA when you replicate a cell. So I told you this is somewhat flexible um, method. And these are some of the different models that I've done this, and this isn't even all of them. We've used this in vitro, in mice, rats, guinea pigs, these strange species called humans, um, clams that live 400 years, dogs, this is C. elegans, and multiple different tissues. And this isn't even an exhaustive list. Okay, so we use these in many different models in very different experimental questions. So when I repeated this study, to see what happens to muscle protein synthesis with age. This is actually a study in rats where we did 24 months and 28 months, which is old. We showed that exactly the opposite, the synthesis rates of proteins were actually increased and older. Now, why is it just because I used a different method that I can, and I forgot to tell you the, the advantage of that method with the water is I can label for weeks rather than just four to six hours. Why does that period of labeling make all the difference in what our result was? And I'll explain that real quick. So muscle is really complex. So if I take a muscle biopsy and get a piece of muscle, muscle isn't just one thing. Within muscle, there's thousands of different proteins. There's actually a couple different cell types there too. But if you have all these thousands of proteins and I measure the synthesis rate of all proteins, it's kind of like an average of all of those, right? So if I take a piece of muscle, and these are some of my own data, and say I just look at mitochondria or um, proteins that are in the mitochondria or the proteins that make up all your contractile proteins that make you, oh, give you big muscle, which doesn't really work for me. Um, but if I look at these average values and I take these bars, this, these bars go to here, these bars go to here, and I look at all the individual proteins, you see that this, the, the fact that they were average were the same hides the variability of all those proteins in there. Some are actually increased with this treatment and some are decreased. And we can't tell that when we look at just the mean value of all the proteins in muscle. So again, why does the period of labeling matter? I'm gonna simplify, simplify this by showing you a modeling experiment that we did using only two proteins. And if I had two proteins, and this is protein A, this is protein B, and this is how many are new over a period of time, and this is the average of the two. If I, um, so I have a fast protein and a slow protein. If I do this four to six hour labeling period, and I take my sample, that synthesis rate is almost completely determined by the fast protein. Now if I label a longer period of time for say up to 28 hours, you see that you have the increasing contribution of the slower proteins. So what we did by labeling for weeks is we got the contributions of slow proteins, which are actually the proteins that give you mass. Okay, and that study that did for four to six hours, which all these things that say protein decreases with age, synthesis decreases with age, they were just really measuring the fast proteins. Okay, so that is why labeling period meant all the difference. Now, this may not matter to some of you, but there's shortcuts or easy ways of doing some measurements. One is an antibody-based um, approach that is called protein synthesis. They use um, this approach to measure synthesis rates of proteins because it's easy. It's like doing a Western blot, and it's become really popular in the literature. 
But this thing, they do it over 20 minutes. And if you look on the bands of the, where all your contractile proteins are, that would give rise to mass, you don't even see, they're not even being measured. Yet this has become a very popular me measurement of muscle protein synthesis. I do not like this method at all because it's not really measuring what uh, we think it's measuring. And most of the people that use this method doesn't re don't realize that. So I'm really interested in these periods. Um, when we get older, we have increased chance of hospitalization. Um, if you put an older person and a younger person in a bed, we lose mu uh, muscle mass at the same rate. But the young person, when you're done with that bed rest period, will gain that muscle back, but an old one, uh, old person does not. So we're interested in how do we prevent losing that muscle mass in those critical periods of disuse during things like hospitalization or casting. So we think of sarcopenia or the loss of muscle mass as being this gradual loss with age, but really there's these critical periods where we lose it and don't gain it back. So we study how can we gain it back so we don't go on this accelerated trajectory. So how many of you lift weights in here? All the muscle heads, raise your hands. Okay, that's a good proportion of you. And what do you always do after you, you do your workout? You drink what? Protein, right? So that protein in the amino acids like leucine, they activate this, this protein called mTOR. And because mTOR ramps up the making of proteins. That's why you consume your chocolate milk or whatever you do, you do after a workout. So the, the idea that this works really well in young people to gain muscle mass, they just took that idea, applied it to old people, and said, OK, they're having trouble regaining their muscle mass after disuse. Let's just give them more protein. That must be the problem. And we activate mTOR and we grow it back. Okay. So we study, we use another rat model for this called Heimlin um, suspension. So the rats walk around on their, hind, or their front legs and their hind limbs actually atrophy over time. This was a model that was actually developed by NASA for disuse. Um, and when we do young and old rats or adult and old rats, you see two different muscles here and you see the old muscle, if we take a snapshot, they don't regain their mass just like we predict in old individuals. But when we measured the rate at which the old um, rats were making their muscle back, this is the blue line is the old, red is the adult. This is how much new protein there are over time, and this is a bar graph showing those data. The old rats actually made muscle proteins better than the adult, yet they're not regaining muscle mass. So this strategy of um, activating mTOR by giving protein, you're trying to fix a problem that doesn't exist, right? They're already making protein better than the adult, so you're not really making that problem better. Um, so what we have found, actually, is it's not the problem. These are, when proteins don't get made well, they, they fold together and they make these little clumps called aggregates. You guys know about Alzheimer's disease. That's one form of aggregates. Um, so what we have found is that the old rats actually make that protein and make that muscle, but it ends up all aggregated and, and not functional muscle. So this taking a blind strategy of what works in, the, in young people and applying it to the adults or the old people does not work. It's actually probably making the problem worse. So what we're trying to do right now is we're going to go in and start treating with something that blocks mTOR. And there's a drug called rapamycin that does this really well. So this is like the worst, um, if you ask any person that builds a lot of muscle mass and you want to inhibit the protein that makes um, the proteins in your muscles, this sounds like a nightmare. But I think this is what we need to do to correct the problem in old muscle. Okay, so we're doing things exactly the opposite of what people are trying to do right now. So what do we learn? Applying what we know from young people and focusing on growth is not the answer and likely makes the situation worse. And focusing attention on slowing the making of proteins is how we propose so that those proteins become functional don't just end up in big clumps. That's what we're trying to focus on. So second story, call this one massaging rats. Um, so I have really good collaborators at the University of Kentucky, and one of them came up with a thing that can, I'll show you a video of it shortly, can massage a rat, basically. 
The idea was that giving something close to a massage, which we call cyclic compressive loading, or CCL, might be a good strategy to help regrow muscle in those that are in the ICU or bedridden and can't do things like lift weights um, to gain mobility back. And um, these are my two collaborators at the University of Kentucky that I've worked with on this project for a couple years now. So here we are. This is. Um, so what's cool about this instrument, it's massaging the rat leg. Here's the little rat leg right here. And this rolls and it has strain gauges in. The reason this works so well is it can constantly adjust the load so it's a consistent load. Okay, so in, like if you do this study in humans and go to 10 different massage people, you're gonna get 10 different loads of massage, right? So this is a very controlled way of doing this. And it's actually um, scaled for rats based on what they thought a Swedish massage would be like, you know, those painful ones. So when we did this study the first time, um, here's a cross section of rat muscle, um, and these are the size of the muscle fibers in the rat when it's normally ambul ambulatory. When we hind limb suspend them, I think you can appreciate these muscle fibers have gotten much smaller. Okay, this is the muscle atrophy process. If we reload them after um, this hind limb unloading, they grow some of that muscle back. But if we reloaded them with massage, we actually got better growth of that muscle back. And you can see this characterized here. This is the cross-section of the muscle at weight bearing. Heimless is suspended, it goes down. Reloading, it starts to come back. This is reloading for seven days. And reloading plus massage came back better. Okay, so this massage was having a positive effect. And we looked at the measure, we measured the rates at which they were making proteins. And this is the normal weight bearing. Heimland suspension, the rate of making proteins goes way down. This is sort of a conservation type thing of energy. When we reload them, it comes back up. And reloaded with massage, it comes back even more. So massage during this recovery period was really effective at helping growing muscle back. That's probably pretty good for um, a real life therapeutic intervention. What was really, really cool, I thought, is we only, re we only massaged the right limb, but the left limb grew back better as well, the one not getting the massage. So this is the rate at making proteins in both the one that was massaged and the one that was not massaged, and they're the same, and the muscle grew back better. So you can have this crossover effect, which is actually kind of cool, because if you had muscle atrophy going on here, you can massage the other leg and have a positive benefit. So the question I always get then is, oh, can I just get a massage and grow muscle? Well, sadly, when we do it in young rats or adult rats who are not have this period of disuse, just going and getting massage didn't help muscle grow at all in the rates of it. So sorry, no benefit for going to get a massage. <laughs> now, when we did it in old rats, which is gonna be really important, we see eight-month rats and 30-month rats. Here's the cross-sectional area of the muscle. Uh, here's reloading, and this is the reloading plus massage. I showed you that this really helped in adult rats. It had no benefit in old rats, sadly. And if we look at the rate of making muscle proteins I showed you before that worked really well in the adult rats, didn't work in the 30-month-old rats, the old rats. But what do you notice? that I showed you before. Look at the reloaded rats versus uh, old ones versus the adult ones. We're reproducing this effect of seeing that old rats already make a lot of protein. Okay, so the massage isn't making it anymore. It's probably hitting a ceiling at that point. And who knows if those are ending up as functional proteins. So what did we learn? CCL can help regrow mu muscle under certain conditions. Uh, we actually have a trial going on in humans now with this. So we put cast humans, young humans, for a while, let the muscle waste, and put them through this protocol. So far, things look pretty good. Um, oops. That massage can improve the regrowth of the non-massaged limb, which is, I think, that crossover effect is really interesting. There's two hypotheses for that, why that might be. One is that um, there's neuro crosstalk, and the other one is muscle can release things called exosomes. Um, that go into the circulation and probably affect other muscles. Uh, we're not really, I don't, I'm not really in favor of that idea, but I think this is a neuromediated effect. 
Um, but it does not work for old muscle, likely because of some of the same way some of those other you know, attempts at regrowing of muscle in old have failed as well. So this is actually story three. Sorry, I rearranged some of this. Um, this is my story about rewriting textbooks. So muscle cells. Do you guys know what the term post-mitotic means? OK, so if you have a cancerous cell, those, cancer, those cells um, replicate, right? And they grow, and you have this proliferation of cells. So we know muscle cells have a bunch of nuclei, and they don't replicate. That's the textbook. You, you have a certain amount of nuclei in a muscle fiber, and the only way that you get new nuclei to help grow the muscle is by these things called um, satellite cells that sit on the periphery. And these satellite cells donate a nuclei so the muscle can grow. That's the textbook knowledge. The take home there is that these nuclei in a muscle fiber don't have the ability to replicate. The heart is like that too, um, and neurons in the brain, although they're starting to see some evidence of neurogenesis in the brain, is like that too. So this has led to therapies to regrow muscle of injecting stem cells. I'm sure most of you have heard about um, stem cell injections for one reason or another. Um, so if you inject muscle stem cells, this should help regrow this muscle since they can't replicate themselves. So it's a good idea. It has failed miserably so far. None of the, these, these cells don't engraft well. They don't work well when they get there. It just hasn't worked very well. So in, I told you at the beginning about when we use deuterium oxide to measure synthesis rates, I can measure the making of DNA as well. That's another thing we do. And that's a measure of cell replication. Now, whenever we took muscle biopsies from humans or tissue from rodents, from rats or mice, we kept on seeing DNA replication in muscle cells, in muscles of these animals or humans. And we saw it so many times, we thought there must be something going on there that we're not appreciating. Why is there replicating DNA in muscle when it's supposed to be a post-mitotic um, cell type? So finally, we decided to try to answer this question. We even did the experiment where we did a, a fancy genetic manipulation and got rid of all the satellite cells, and we still saw this DNA replication. Because we thought maybe it was just the, the satellite cells replicating, and it wasn't. So it really got us thinking, do these nuclei really get to, do they really replicate? And maybe the textbooks are wrong about this. So I'm going to walk you through this. And, and don't worry if you don't completely get this experiment, because it's um, a little bit complicated. So we have these mice that are genetically manipulated so that I can light up only the nuclei in myofibers. Okay, I can make them green. By turning on, by giving a, uh, this treatment, it turns on all these, myo, um, all these nuclei in the myofiber turn green. No other kinds of nuclei turn green, only the ones in the myofiber. Okay? I turn this off, it stops labeling them green. Then I started my deuterium oxide, and we dissected the muscles, and then we only pulled out the, cell, the nuclei that were green because we knew they were in the myofiber. If they were green and had deuterium in them, that told us that my nuclei were replicating. That was the only way you could be green and have deuterium in them. And so recently, we did that experiment. And you can see, here's an image of all the myonuclei um, green. Um, and these are a bunch of different muscles, two different ways of us making sure we weren't making a mistake. And we actually see that myofibers are replicating their nuclei. And we know it's not any kind of other nuclei that are replicating. So because this goes against dogma and textbook, we have to show this like 10 other different ways. But we're pretty sure the textbooks are wrong. And that the why this is important is if these stem cell therapies are failing, but your myonuclei can replicate themselves, we could be focusing on how to make them replicate rather than trying to introduce new cell types and harness the ability the muscle already has to repair itself. So we're, we're working on that. So 
stem cells, skeletal muscle cells, myocytes are not post-mitotic, that's what we learned. And we may be able to harness that ability to replicate rather than rely on stem cell therapies and muscle. Okay, this is one that I just added this morning. Um, I was gonna give you another story about metformin and aging and it's really cool data and it's got out there a lot, but I thought you guys would appreciate this one more. And this is, I haven't shown these data in a couple years, um, so forgive me if I stumble a little bit through this, but this is about how to run a thousand miles. So if you guys left here and ran to Tucson, you'd, that'd be 909 miles, okay? If you ran to Toronto, that was still not a thousand miles. Yet these guys do it all the time, okay? The Iditarod sled dog race, they run a thousand miles in eight or nine days, okay? These dogs are incredible athletes, and these are actually some of the dogs I've had the pleasure of working with up in Alaska. So if you run, a run well, if you're doing endurance exercise for long periods of time, what have you been taught that you use for energy, fat or carbohydrate, for really long periods? You're supposed to rely on fat, right? And the studies that were done in these dogs made that assumption but they also just looked at blood concentrations and saw, oh, fatty acids and glycerol are up. They must be using fat because those values are up in the blood. So we decided to readdress this using our tracers, um, that assumption. So here's energy expenditure for strenuous exercise, Tour de France cyclists, which is about as big as you get in humans, mountain climbers, US Marines, and racing sled dogs. Okay, huge energy expenditures, daily energy expenditures. So, this is what it's like when you do testing with a sled dog. Notice everybody is bundled up in here. That's because sled dog's weaknesses is warmth. So we have to do these studies in a room that's cooled. Even 15 degrees is a little warm for the dogs. And you'll notice that I, there is this tube, insulated tube going to the dog. When you do isotope infusions through an IV line and you're working in 15 degrees, they tend to freeze. Okay, so we had to take all kinds of steps to do this um, and make it work. And you know how you guys do VO2 mass tests with a, a mouthpiece? You, here's the little hood for VO2 for the dog, okay? And the dogs love this running, okay? We put a little harness on the back so they feel like they're pulling. Um, so we went up, I don't want you to take in all this information, but I wanna show you how many different combinations of tracers I did in these dogs over the period of about um, January 2013, 2014, March 2013, what we did is we'd go up there during a period where they weren't trained, as, as detrained as these dogs get, and then we got them the day they finished the Iditarod, they took a plane flight back to the lab, and then we tested them, okay? So some long days when they were done with the Iditarod. So here's a dog using its mask, you guys are familiar with RER, right? 0.9 is, you know, you go 1.0, 1, 1 that's carbohydrate um, and fat, the other direction. Here's the green bar is what they were when they were untrained, and this is when they were trained. So these RERs are about 0.9, which are the, what the dog is using mostly carbohydrate. And if I calculate that out by mass and by percentage of the fuels, you'll see that they're primarily dependent on carbohydrate. Now, most of you probably know from your exercise physiology that we store very little carbohydrate as glycogen in muscle and even less in liver. So how can you fuel a thousand mile run on carbohydrate and not fat? So when we look at, when we used our tracers to look at the glucose appearing in the blood and disappearing, um, presumably because it was um, oxidized, um, I don't want to go through all of these, but here I want to show you this. This is the rate glucose is disappearing into the muscle during exercise, and this blue line is what we'd commonly see in humans, and dogs are doing this at almost twice the rate, okay? Again, how do they run that far using almost all carbohydrate? And this is a very low intensity exercise we did these studies at. Dogs have VO2 max, as David's probably going to argue, Dr. Poole's going to probably argue me on this one, but I think it's probably about 250 mils per kg. Do you want to up that number a little? No, the greyhounds that we reported was all the one greyhound, the best we've ever um, got data on, was about 250. 
Yeah, so best estimates, these dogs are probably 250, maybe probably even higher, VO2 max. Okay, that's pretty darn high. Um, so what was the biggest shocker though is glycerol. When we make, when we liberate fats, right, you have your three fatty acids and your glycerol backbone. When that glycerol gets dumped into the blood, um, it goes to the liver to be made into glucose. Okay, that's called gluconeogenesis. And the rate of appearance of glycerol was sky high in these dogs. And its disappearance was too. So these are human values at the same exercise intensity. And look at how high these, these um, dogs are. So what the dogs are doing is they're really liberating um, the fats for the glycerol. Glycerol is going to the liver to be made into glucose and they're burning the glucose as energy. So they're kind of dependent on fat in a way, but they're really burning um, carbohydrate at the muscle. So we never would have known this if we wouldn't have done the tracer experiments. So I went way back in the literature to uh, late 60s, early 70s, where these people had shown here's the rate of disappearance of glucose, and this is the glycerol going to glucose, and this is a study in dogs. And the, basically what this study shows is the more glycerol you give to the dogs, the more glucose they make. And there doesn't appear to be a ceiling on that. Whereas humans, we hit a ceiling. Our liver, the dog's liver is way better at making glucose than ours, okay? So there was precedent for this. So what did we learn? Contrary to what was assumed in the literature, Iditarod sled dogs are reliant on glucose during exercise. However, the glucose is probably made by a high rate of gluconeogenesis. So you're using fat in a different way. And I bet you when they're resting, they're probably using a ton of fat, okay, when they're not exercising. So if you want to know more about the really cool dogs, um, Dr. Poole has written a really nice article about how incredible athletes these dogs are. But this article actually mostly focuses on horses for some reason. I think the dogs are way cooler, but dogs get short shrift in this paper. So to wrap up today, in physiology, we are often limited to snapshots at distinct points in time that may limit our view of the dynamic changes that are constantly occurring in the body. So stable isotopes, which has become my my you know, go-to tool and sort of my expertise has allowed me to capture a lot of these dynamic events. Um, and we really try to understand the remodeling and the changes in flux that improve health. So I didn't go into you know, the whole you know, five talks worth of material I'd have on aging with you today, but we're really understand, trying to understand how to slow that aging process to be happy and healthy. Um, I wanted to more illustrate to you all how to use tools to constantly question what we think we already know and I encourage you to approach problems differently and not assume that what, you, um, what is told to you as being, the, as being true is always true. You always have to keep questioning it in different ways. There's almost nothing proved in science. In fact, I very much dislike the word proved. Okay, I, I, can't, I don't let my students use it at all. Okay, so we always question um, what you see as the data. And with that, I wanna acknowledge, um, I have a really outstanding lab right now that at Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation. And I've gotten involved in a lot of things. I'm involved in the Diabetes Center, I'm in the Geroscience Center where we do a lot of brain stuff. Um, I'm involved with the Nathan Schock Center, which is basic biology of aging, and here's my funding. Um, and I would happily take any questions that you all might have. Yeah. So, um, well, for the dogs, you can hear me, can't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we'll get recorded. Gosh. So the dogs diet, is it high fat then, even though they're using mostly glucose? Yeah, the dog's diet is very high fat. Like they get straight up lard sometimes, just to get enough calories in them. Yeah, there's, there's a missing piece here. You know, ketones have become a very hot area. Um, ketones are really, really hard to do tracer studies with, 
So we don't know what the ketones are doing yet. And that might be another piece of this puzzle. Very nice talk. Thanks. Yeah. In your opinion, is aging a disease? <laughs> um, I, I'm suffering. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it matters that aging is a disease or not. What I think matters that aging is the, uh, is the number one predictor of, all, of almost every chronic disease. Okay, so this is what we're doing in the aging field right now. And it's not even close um, how much the other um, risk factors contribute to a disease um, compared to aging. So the idea in the aging field right now is rather than go after um, cancer, um, heart disease, um, stroke, or any of these things singly, because we tend to get these things more than one of them as we get older, if we slow the aging process, we're simultaneously treating all these conditions at the same time. And that's the, that's the idea that's been advanced in the, you know, aging used to be um, a field that didn't have much credibility, you know, as people fountain of youth, make you live 150, I have this snake oil, this kind of thing. And we're really, the field has really evolved from that. And, you know, if we can s slow this aging process, we can, we can extend this period of health, which we call the health span, rather than the lifespan. Nobody wants to add 40 years of morbidity and um, lack of independence. What we're trying to do is extend that period of, of health and independence. So it doesn't matter to me if it's a disease or not, but it does cause, I think, contribute to all these other con chronic diseases. So before we take any additional questions, uh, I know some students have evening classes and stuff, so uh, I think if you've got to go to that, go ahead. Anybody who wants to stick around for Q&A, definitely do that. We'll take a quick pause for anybody who has to head to class. <coughs> Very fascinating work in, in uh, uh, your study. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just curious about the, you know, they're getting uh, an R of uh, 0.9 just from the glycerol. They're releasing a tremendous amount of free fatty acids. Yeah. What, what's actually happening? To, oh, that was close. What's happening to the um, uh, free fatty acids? I. It's a good question. Um, it's it's the logical question, and it's the one I it's one I don't know the answer for. Um, I suspect that some of it is recycled into triglycerides, um, and that might be part of a heating mechanism in these dogs. I, I don't know that. That's pure speculation. Um, but they they have to be going somewhere, and I and I. We haven't traced fatty acids yet because it's a little more complicated, especially under those cold conditions, to do that infusion. Um, but yeah, I don't know yet. And it's, it's an excellent question. Thank you for your talk, really yes, interesting. Um, I was wondering what you were going to share um, on metformin and okay. maybe its effect <laughs> on muscle or with aging? Or? Yeah, so I took that out at the last minute. Um, I gave this to the grad students. If, if you guys want 10 minutes, I'll give you some of that, if you want to see that. Oh, it's not actually on these slides. Oh, no, they are. I have them. So, OK, so there's evidence that metformin can slow the aging process, okay? And it's, it's evidence that was gathered from model organisms, but it's also um, when you, they did a, a study in people with type 2 diabetics and matched them, 
that had metformin and um, other subjects that weren't on metformin, there was actually a, uh, increased survival in the diabetics that was taking metformin compared to the controls. And which led to the provocative title of this paper, can, can people with diabetes live longer um, than normal people if they're on metformin? So there's a clinical trial going forward. It's the first um, for aging using metformin. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, of this, you know, there's this evidence that metformin may um, extend lifespan in model organisms. There's 50 years of safety data for metformin because of all the diabetics that are on it. It's very cheap, it has very few side effects and some evidence. But, um, so almost all the data in metformin was collected in people that have disease of some sort, like diabetics or whoever else is taking metformin. And we asked the question, if, if you want to extend the period of health um, free of disease, we have to know how, and if you want to use metformin to increase that period, you have to know how metformin works in healthy people, right? Because that's when you would start taking it to prolong the period free of chronic disease. So when you're not sick yet. Um, and then we're interested in, in exercise, of course, as well. And we, we sort of rationalized that people that would be um, taking metformin to extend lifespan or people that are exercising, people that are interested in their health and living longer are likely to use more than one strategy at a time, right? You eat well and exercise, or if we so show that metformin works and then you exercise as well. And I have anecdotal, um, I've heard a lot of stories that are people that are already taking metformin who are not um, diseased because they heard that it extends lifespan or health span. So we did a study, 12 weeks, placebo-controlled um, metformin, people exercise for 12 weeks, biopsies, all kinds of stuff. Um, and what I want to show is um, the most important thing. So we showed that it, it blunts the improvement in VO2 max, okay, that you get from the exercise, um, which other people have showed before. But these are the data that are, are most interesting to me. Um, so here's the placebo group that um, exercised for 12 weeks and their insulin sensitivity improved, like you would expect with exercise. Metformin by itself improves insulin sensitivity. Exercise by itself improves insulin sensitivity. When we did exercise and metformin, that improvement was completely blunted. You had no benefit. And here's all the individual subjects, the change in insulin sensitivity, the placebo group who exercised, you see they all, all improved insulin sensitivity except one, one strange person. Look at, so the metformin on average and exercise did not, as a group, improve insulin sensitivity. But look at the amount of variability in those subjects compared to these subjects. So what we were really interested in is what do these people share in common and these people share in common? Why did some people come out of our study having taken metformin and exercising and actually had worse insulin sensitivity. How does that happen? So we, we broke them out and analyzed a number of different things. What we found out was that the people that positively responded um, had the high fasting insulin, high fasting glucose, and low complex activity of the mitochondria. These were the people that entered the study the worst um, metabolically, on the metabolically healthy. The people that were the negative responders that came out worse, these were the people that were most healthy when they entered the study. Okay, so we weren't powered to test this question directly. It was something we found after the fact. Um, so what we have done now is I have a current clinical trial where we directly um, answer this question. We have people that are insulin sensitive, insulin resistant, not diabetic, but relatively insulin resistant, placebo metformin, 12 weeks, we took exercise out. And we're trying to, we're trying to determine if you're healthy and you take metformin, does that have detrimental effects? Because if everybody starts taking metformin because it extends lifespan, but it, people that are already healthy, it's actually having a worse effect. Like, not, having no effect is no problem. Making people worse is a problem, okay? So that's what we're testing right now. So this, this did get some press, New York Times type stuff, coverage for our original um, study, um, which was nice. Um, but we're really interested in this question now. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dr. Miller. Very 
very nice talk indeed. So are you measuring VO2 max on this to see if they go down with the metformin? Um, we did in the exercise one. But, but they didn't, they stayed, they stayed calm, but that was across the training, right? Um, so here. So in the right columns, they, they at least they, they didn't show the increase, but they didn't go down. No, they didn't go down. So that, I mean, that some, of them, some of them did. Yeah, 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 but the average. Right. But now, if, if you have the, the study you're doing at the moment, you're, you really want to ask, you know, answer the question for different variables. Would you hypothesize that maybe, you know, um, the O2 max will go down in the group, irrespective of whether they're chronic exercises or, or not? Yeah, so we're, we don't have the O2 max as an outcome this time. Um, but we, I mean, we're doing mitochondrial respiration studies. So we're looking at mitochondrial um, function in the muscle. But of course, we're missing the cardiovascular component by just looking at the mitochondria. So no, because it was not an exercise trial, we didn't do VO2 max in this follow-up study, which you're pointing out is an oversight on our part. <laughs> well, I didn't review the graph. <laughs> um, well, one other question. Now, you said those dogs, um, when you looked at that, it was beautiful metabolic studies, by the way, it was terrific stuff, um, that you didn't run them very hard. No. Nope. So if you do run them harder, if they're like humans and other dogs that we have data for, as Larry Rao and people showed, their liver blood flow will be you know, going down to maybe a quarter of what it is at rest. Yeah. How is that uh, liver converting glycerol to uh, glucose? Uh, how does that add up then? What are your thoughts? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, you know, we were exercising them at the best I could estimate would be about 40% of their VO2 max. So we thought that the, we were trying to approximate what they were doing on the trail. Okay. Um, so if they, you know, these dogs are not like your greyhounds. They're not, they're not sprinters. You know, they're built for trotting along at a um, six to eight miles per hour kind of thing. Six to 10 miles per hour, I guess, in the top top dogs, but I don't, um, it's a good question. I mean, we have no measurements of, of blood flow to the liver or something um, from these dogs, but that could affect delivery for sure. Of course, Ken Hinchcliffe showed that at 40% of the U2 max, there's still 100 mils per kilo per minute. So no, they're, yeah. they're, they're using as much oxygen as the fittest ever humans. Yeah, oh, well, for sure, measured. yeah. Yeah, they're incredible. I was curious for the humans, in a sense, when it comes to aging, um, how much did intensity for physical activity play a role in um, any of your studies so far? So humans' intensity. Uh, so the exercise training tr trial we did with the metformin, that was pretty, um, a lot of these people were initiating an exercise training. So it wasn't sprint interval training or anything like that. Um, that would be another question. We haven't directly, we haven't tested the effect of, of exercise intensity in any of our studies yet. Um, so I, I can't answer that one. I mean, we're really interested in sustainable, you know, what are, the exercise that people are gonna do is the best kind of exercise, you know, as long as they're doing it. I guess, I, I guess can I follow up question on that? Yeah. Um, so kind of as we're looking at, well, people age, ideally we age into a disability or some people age with a disability, there's that loss of functional capacity for mm -hmm. you know, maximal contractions and being able to have that sub-maximal strength to go through activities of daily living. Um, it's a big thing when it comes to just overall relative strength. Um, as Has strength measures been associated? I mean, if someone's oh, aging yeah. and can't lift a 40 pound bag of dog food, there's a good chance that they may be starting to look at going to the home soon. Well, there's all kinds of yeah, morbidity and mortality uh, associated with um, uh, some of those outcomes that you mentioned. Yes, Th those are you know, the huge, large scale um, epidemiological type studies that we don't really do, but there are a lot of data about uh, whether it's one rep max or um, things like that that associate with morbidity and independence, um, for sure. We're really focused, I'm really focused on the aerobic exercise um, for the mitochondria, more so than the strength training um, stuff, but there's benefits to both of those, for sure.
Uh, when you talk about muscle loss and aging, uh, what, goes, what goes wrong in the process of protein synthesis? <laughs> Good question. Uh, I think that's what we're trying to figure out. It's like, why, why is that not working anymore? Why, and what I think is, um, here's how I explain. Okay, so there's this idea in physiology of stress resistance. Okay, so our, our cells are constantly stressed and you adapt to that stress. So exercise is a stress to the cell, okay? Um, when we eat a phytochemical that makes our cells stronger, that phytochemical in a plant functions as an insecticide versus for a little bug. You know, it has a big effect on a little bug, but it has a nice positive effect in us. So as you adapt to stress, adapting to stress takes energy, and you have a finite amount of energy in the cell. So if you're constantly adapting to these stresses, but all, and you have to maintain the cell and fix everything, then that takes energy, and you have to do all this me metabolic stuff that costs energy. So I think as age goes on, all these things that cost energy um, one thing will start to compromise another one and steal from the other one. So I think the amount of energy that is maybe going into making proteins is keeping the cell from adapting to something else. Um, and then it compromises that, and then that leads to more damage. And, and you know, it's this triangle is the way I think of it. That my research program is this intersection of stress resistance, energetics, and protein turnover, because all three of those things rely on each other. And if you compromise one, you're going to compromise the other two. So I think with age, I don't know why it happens or why it has to happen, but that balance gets mixed up and it starts stressing the cell so it can't adapt to normal other stressors. It's a, it's a very good question. I'm uh, kind of branching off of that. I was wondering if you have any opinion with that. Uh, All kinds of opinions. With, yeah, <laughs> with using uh, testosterone replacement therapy and hormone replacement therapy and decreasing that aging process on muscle mass and strength. So that's uh, a it's an active area of research. Um, there seems to be some times when it can have a benefit, and there seems to be times where it um, does more harm than good. Okay, it's still a very active area. It's not one that I'm actively involved in. But um, it, there's more to know about it, for sure. I mean, the, what I can say for sure is if it, there's not enough there, it's probably a problem, OK? So people, some forms of cancer, the, the men will go on androgen deprivation therapy, where they take away the androgens. And they have real problems with muscle mass. But giving more than you need doesn't always have this extra benefit. Well, I was thinking more based off Yeah. You know, again, this goes back to I don't think the strategies that work in young people are going to be always the same that work in old people because I just think the system is different and we have to approach it different. And I think the problem we're running into a lot is just trying to, this works in young people, apply it to old. And I don't think it, it's always going to work out that way. Okay. I can't say for sure in this instance, but that's generally how I think about things. effect on protein synthesis as well. You've got those other systems that are also uh, degenerating. Oh, for sure. Yeah, all the sort of regulatory systems are all changing at the same time, the neuro and the endocrine. Yes, definitely. Yep. Are you giving up on the microphone? Or <laughs> <laughs> Given the uh, loss in type 2 fibers with EG, mm -hmm. um, and the, the remnant of type 1s and, and some of the changes in, in the um, uh, neural adaptations that are going on. How much of uh, that do you think is complicating the picture as well? Uh, oh, tons. So there's this idea, that, so the question about fiber type going to type 1 and the loss of type 2 muscle fibers. So it's a very well described phenomenon now that we have these periods of denervation and re innervation and that you have these denervations of type 2 muscle fibers and um, not necessarily getting re -innervated. and that's causing the dropout, basically, of type 2 fibers, which, you know, you need for certain things. Um, so that is a really active area of research. What is causing this, these denervation events at the neuromuscular junction? Um, you know, oxidative stress and all these things, um, because that's a really energetic um, process to release those vesicles and, and reuptake and everything like that. So 
uh, the person in the office next door to me, she studies, she's an expert in neuromuscular junction. And, and I learned from her, but it's, it's, a to, it's a really, really important area of, of the muscle loss. And one that should be targeted, um, probably, to maintain muscle mass. Okay, with that, thank you. Sure.